Let's bring in our guest now, um, the legendary Professor Richard Wolf, uh, the host of Democ uh, Economic Update, and also a good friend of the show. Professor Wolf, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks to thanks to you for the invitation. So we wanted to discuss uh, the significance of May Day with you. It's something that's uh, certainly been co-opted, the, the true history of it erased um, in the United States context. And uh, we couldn't think of anyone better than you to come and, and help us unpack what, what May Day really represents. Okay. Um, I won't dwell on the specific history. Folks can look that up. Uh, but basically... The day began in 1886 in Chicago. It's an American event that sparked the creation of this global, now global holiday. Uh, very importantly, people had gathered for a big demonstration in Chicago to celebrate and to continue the struggle for what was then called the eight hour day. And what that was about was that capitalists had typically employed people here in the United States in the previous century, uh, really since the beginning of the United States as an independent country, uh, and even before that, for 16, 14, 12, 10 hours a day, every day, six days a week, by the way, uh, until the working class in America began to do what it had also done in other parts of the world, which is fight back and say, no, it's inhumane to do that. And had been pushing for the eight hour day. And the rally in Chicago uh, was for that. And as had been done, Lord knows how many times, somebody, no one ever really figured out who, uh, in a rally that was mostly peaceful, somebody threw a bomb, people got hurt, the government immediately arrested anarchist agitators. That's how they were called. Several of them were executed. Long story short, it became a kind of sign of, of the struggle working people, the vast majority, have to undertake against a dominant minority uh, that behaves in horrific ways listening to you talk a few moments ago about the U.S. history in Guatemala, you know, it's not all that different here at home. Much of the same astonishing words to cover a reality that couldn't be further uh, from the truth. And the, the only other interesting thing really about it is that around the world, the 1st of May, which is when that rally took place back in 1886 in Chicago, the 1st of May became a global working day, working men and women holiday. In many, many countries, uh, everything stops on May Day. Big demonstrations, trade unions, socialist, communist, uh, political parties, labor parties, they all get together and they march down the major streets of cities around the world. They're doing it as we speak. Uh, only in the United States, uh, in the aftermath of World War II when anti-communism went crazy in this country, it was decided not anymore uh, to celebrate or allow the celebration of May Day. After all, don't gasp now, communists celebrated too. So we had a shift. I don't remember exactly when that happened, but I, we had the shift, we canceled May Day, and we established in the United States alone, Labor Day that first Monday in September, to make it as far as possible away conceptually and historically from the May Day it once was. And it's this kind of a metaphor, if you like, for the attempt, systematic since 1945, to denigrate, to demote, and to uh, demonize everything on the left that questions or challenges capitalism as a system. Uh, first of all, Professor Wolf, I want to thank you for your camera looks great and you look great um, in, in, in HD, I got to say. Um, thank you for that. Uh, we, we're just coming off uh, the first hundred days of the Biden administration. I wanted to just get your take on the on Biden's economic policies so far. What do you like? What do you make of it? Well, uh, I think it's a, bit, a, a mixed bag. I am taken and I want to be clear about it. I am taken with the fact that 
what I had listened to the campaign, I kept hearing that the Biden, Obama, Clinton, Democratic Center was determined to get us back to normal, which kept being defined as back to the way things were before Trump got elected. And I remember thinking to myself, that is crazy. The way we were before Trump got elected was what got Trump elected. And if you're going to go back to that, you are paving the way for the next Trump, whether or not the name is spelled T-R-U-M-P or not, really doesn't matter. Um, and I will say, and I'm happy about it, that the Democratic Party center has moved to the left. Not all that far, as I'll explain in a moment, but there's definitely more willingness uh, to help people out, to use the government as an offset to the awful failures of private capitalism in this country, which include the failure to prepare for or contain COVID, the failure to prepare for or contain the third economic collapse of this new century after the uh, dot-com crash of 2000 and the subprime mortgage crash of 2008. I mean, the failures are spectacular. Private capitalism in the driver's seat. We've had 40 years of redistributing wealth and income in this country, roughly 1980 to 2020, going in the direction of taking wealth away from the bottom and away from the middle to give it especially to the tippity top. Never would we have been less in need of a tax cut for corporations and the rich than we were in 2017, and yet Mr. Trump gifted them with a bigger one than ever before. I mean, making inequality, of course, spike even further. Uh, I mean, the, the list is extraordinary. And I am taken with the fact that there is going to be work done to try to deal at least with some of the problems and to make the cost of it, at least to some degree, come out of the people who have been ripping us off for the last 40 years. So I, I admire that. I'm glad that that's happening. My understanding and the way I see it is that this is not so much a response uh, to Bernie and AOC, important as they have been. Uh, the pressure they've put on has certainly affected Mr. Uh, Biden's move to the left a little bit. Uh, and I don't want to take away credit from them for that. But I think it's basically that this is a system that is in terribly deep trouble. I tell a little story that might interest your, your viewers. Uh, because I went to Harvard and Yale and I know all those people and they know me and Janet Yellen was my classmate in, in graduate school and all the rest, um, I'm in touch with those people. I know them personally, and they know me, etc. And when we get together occasionally for coffee or drinks, here's what is interesting. We don't agree on how we got into this situation, and we do not agree about how to get out. But we look around the table, and we are surprised to discover that very much the following sentence is believed by almost everyone. This is the worst condition of American capitalism in our lifetimes. Uh, whether you look at the level of government debt, the astonishing level of corporate debt, the level of inequality, the stupefying reality that the United States has 4% of the world's population and 20% of the world's COVID deaths. I mean, you're looking at levels of dysfunction that are so many with all the social problems being aggravated along the way that it's very hard to see a way out and that Mr. Biden figured out with his advisors that they better do something is a tribute to just how bad it is and how bankrupt the traditional middle of the road policies of both Republicans and Democrats have been. And so they're, they're gingerly going a little bit to the left, but the comparisons, this is my last point here, the comparisons with Franklin Roosevelt, I find amazing. First of all, let's be honest about all the good things Mr. Roosevelt did. Most of them have been undone after he died, after 1945. Whatever he did didn't make it durable. But what he did do makes what Mr. Biden is doing 
very pale and very modest. There's no grand institution building like Roosevelt did with Social Security or unemployment compensation. Roosevelt's regime passed the first minimum wage in America. This regime can't even get it to where it already is in every decent country of Western Europe and in many other parts of the world. And there's no federal jobs program of the sort that was an enormous success and crucial to everything in the New Deal. So, I mean, the comparison with Mr. Uh, Roosevelt, which should be a critical comparison, isn't to begin with, and it isn't accurate either. By comparison, what Mr. Biden is doing is much too little and much too late. Hmm. You know, to that point, um, you know, there are some signs indicating that the capitalists are, are anxious. For instance, yep. investment is down. Uh, of course, money hoarding is happening in these offshore accounts. And as we all know, like clockwork, every 10 years or so, there's some sort of economic collapse. <laughs> it's been 13 years since uh, the 2008 economic collapse. Um, since we're almost, uh, you know, what do you suspect uh, is, is likely to happen in the near future? And, and what should the left do to basically deal with it or respond? Well, I'm no great viewer into the future um, any more or less than anybody else. So my best guess is that these policies, however much they help this or that part of the population, and I don't want to take away from the importance of it again, it's good to do but it will not solve the basic problems of this society. They have been kicked down the road so often, uh, whether you look at our race relationships where it's kind of clear that whatever was done in the past isn't enough, I feel exactly the same way about our economic system and I therefore am very pessimistic. I think it's gonna get worse and that the people in the best condition to take advantage of the worsening is the same right wing that did it to get Trump in there and will figure out uh, or certainly try to make use of the failure to solve these problems. So my more important point is how to solve them. And I think the lesson to be learned, particularly from the last crisis, the Great Depression, and from all that was done by Roosevelt then, is that he didn't take the last step. He didn't take the step of saying, the people who gather the profits of this society into their hands, the small minority we call employers or capitalists or whatever you want to call them, those people were left with regulations and rules and limits. And that's what the New Deal did but because they were left in their positions of power at the top of enterprises, gathering into their hands the profits. They had every incentive to undo the New Deal and the profits gave them the wherewithal to respond to those incentives. And lo and behold, in the last 50 years, that's what we did. The real wage became a bad joke, embarrassing in this country, in this world at this time. Much of the Social Security benefits were eaten up by inflation and other limitations uh, that are built into them. The same is true of unemployment. And there hasn't even been a discussion of a, of a federal jobs program, despite monumental unemployment. It seems to me that the lesson we have to learn and what the left needs to face up to and talk to is that you've got to change the internal structure of corporations and capitalism in America. And for me, the answer seems straightforward. It's the democratization of the enterprise. Stop allowing a tiny minority to sit at the top of every enterprise, the owner, the owner's family, the board of directors that are elected by the major shareholders. These are tiny groups of people who sit at the top of every, almost every enterprise, making all the key decisions, what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and all the consequences of that. And then they decide to take the profits which go into their hands and lo and behold, give the bulk of them to themselves. This is a surprise. You, you have to face that if you don't change that, if you don't put the people, the workers and the communities into a democratic ownership and control of enterprises, you're not going to change the basic logic driving this system and frustrating those on the left who keep trying to change it but come up against an organization 
peculiarly well suited to block and stop it. I wanted to uh, ask you about, um, I think, kind of piggybacking on what you just uh, what you just discussed, because I think that the um, the the majority of people that I see talking about the economic situation are predicting on the back of the COVID uh, lockdowns and the sort of freeze that that put on economic activity um, as people get vaccinated here in the United States, although not not in the rest of the world, but here in the United States, the vaccine has been rolled out you know, remarkably quickly, I would say. Um, and, and you know, people are preparing for a white boy summer or, or, uh, or uh, you know, just an exciting kind of summer of, of hedonism and, and economic activity as they as they get out. And this coupled with the Biden stimulus and things like that is going to create um, uh, fuel and economic boom, the likes of which we haven't seen in a, in a long time. What do you make of that narrative and, uh, and, and, and that whole talk? You know, it's possible, but I think it is wildly overblown. The comparisons that are made, indeed, the image that this is drawn from is what happened after World War II. But it, other than that, there's no parallel here. World War II, let's remember, came at the end of a world war that had lasted six or so years in terms of its beginning. And that world war started at the end of a dozen years of global depression. You put that all together and you're talking nearly two decades of stalled consumption, of pent up demand, all those phrases being thrown around now. What we have is one year or a year and a half. That, that's all the difference in the world, but there are more differences. Americans are loaded up with debt in a way they weren't, couldn't even dream of in 1946. Much of whatever money they get in their hands now will have to be devoted to doing away with some of the debt overhang that's crushing them. And that's a radical difference. Number three, the United States is more dependent on buying goods and services from abroad today than anything that happened in 1946. So much of the money being pumped in has been and will continue to flow out of the United States for all kinds of purposes. And finally, at the end of World War II, the United States emerged as the only significant capitalist power. All of the other ex-competitors and potential competitors had been effectively destroyed economically, if not militarily, and often both, by World War II, with the exception of the United States. We have a very different situation now because the, the United States faces an equal and more rapidly growing competitor, something we have not had for half a century, and the fumbling and bumbling of dealing with it is a sign that they don't know what to do about it or how to contain it. If you put all of that together, there are major obstacles to having anything remotely like these fantastic descriptions of a boom, which I understand come after a rough year, but that doesn't mean they aren't subject to the kind of criticism that a historical awareness really calls for. To end the interview, I would like to ask about Janet Yellen's proposal for a global minimum corporate tax. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And how much do you think it would do to, to solve some of the uh, issues or some of the problems that were brought forth by globalization? Well, with all due respect, um, I think this is rhetoric, this is window dressing, this is uh, uh, PR, I mean, that, that's all this is. The United States long ago lost the world position it once had to be able to come up with such an idea and actually see other countries feeling the need to fall into line. That's over. The United States cannot even get the Germans uh, to make any kind of change in the deal they've struck with Russia uh, to bring in that gas in the Nord Stream uh, pipeline. It's a wonderful example of the power the United States no longer has in the world. So it's just a suggestion. Many countries would have to sign on. Most of them aren't going to do it. Uh, if it did happen, and that's what she's 
pointing at. The real purpose is to lessen the opposition of big business in America, particularly multinational business, to any attempt to raise back the corporate tax uh, from the 21% Trump lowered it to, to the 35% it was before Trump lowered it. As it is, Mr. Biden only proposed halfway back to 28, mm -hmm. and everyone knows he's not going to get that either. If he gets anything, it'll be 24 or 5, something like that, which is really small. But they even have to mollify the big businesses about that. And the point then is, well, don't worry you won't be hurt by the competition of other countries and companies getting lower rates because we're out there beating the bushes to raise it everywhere else. So you won't be at a disadvantage for the little bit we're proposing to raise it. It's a demonstration of the craven relationship between the Democrats and big business, despite the rhetoric, because it's very hard nosed. And all she's doing is saying, well, we will at least try to, to make it less disadvantageous to be here in the United States. As I think you know, in economics, it's long been a tradition for us to distinguish between the posted rate of profit on, a, on corporations and what's called the effective rate. In other words, what corporations actually pay is so different from what's posted that the economics profession, to do its analysis, has to deal with what the real rate is. We won't say real because that implies that the other one is phony, which it is. So we use a nice polite word like effective. But the effective rate of the United States wasn't 35% before. It was around 27%. And the effective rate now is in the neighborhood of 21 or 22 percent, which is more or less what it is in many other uh, advanced capitalist countries. So much of this palaver is a public rhetor rhetorical game around posted rates that aren't the reality, neither for the corporations, nor for the government, nor even the late in the, in the game economics profession, which has had to accommodate these realities. Professor Richard Wolf, always great to have you on to give us a dose of truth serum. Uh, you don't get it everywhere. So it was wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time. And thank you, because really, knowing the realities of the economy have never been more important for people to understand than now. And I think, and I don't mean this to, to flatter you, but doing these kinds of exposures and doing these kinds of conversations is an enormously important public service. So I thank Absolutely. you as well. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thank you.